There we go. Now we're live. Hi, everyone. Welcome. I have another guest with me, and I'm so excited to introduce Dr. Melissa Satterman. And she is a lifestyle physician as well as a plant based endurance athlete. And she's going to be talking today um, a little bit about. Um, her philosophy with, you know, treating her patients and also your journey, right? So we'll, we'll just get right into it. But I love to hear from you, you know, tell everyone who you are and just a little bit about yourself. Okay, well, thanks for having me on today. I know we've connected through social media and it's always great to then, not that we're in the same room, but to put a face uh, to a name and um, on a, a mutual journey. So like you introduced myself, my name is Melissa Sunderman. I am, um, well, I'm a physician, yes, but I'm, I think more than that. So um, I've been married um, to my best friend for 25 years. We just celebrated our 25th anniversary. We're actually in Iceland this summer with our kids. I have two kids. They're um, young adults now. Um, my son is 22 and a senior at Michigan State University, and my daughter is a junior at the University of Michigan. And then since we're empty nesters, of course, we have two furry fellows that are, our, <laughs> you know, our other babies. And so we have a rescue who's seven, and he is a black lab, great Pyrenees, probably Newfie. Um, so a big boy. And then... Um, a Bernice mountain dog that's a little bit over a year that's a tank and probably like 120 pounds. So um, <laughs> yeah, so I live in the Ann Arbor, Michigan area. Uh, I went to University of Michigan, undergrad, Michigan State University for med school. And um, the kids are in state for college, which is great because we get to see them and then also helps out tuition bills. So we love Ann Arbor. Um, and I moved around a uh, a lot as a kid, so it's good to plant some roots here in Michigan. And I, I see your posts. I think we are experiencing the same kind of weather right now where uh, we Cold. are still getting out, <laughs> but we're bundled up and trying to embrace um, the weather. So, yes, yeah, so I'm a practicing physician. I see patients in my office. I'm actually at my office right now and just finished up patients for the day to uh, record this podcast with you. Awesome. Very cool. Very cool. And as a physician practicing for 20 years, how has your style of practicing changed on how or how you treat your patients if it has? So it's a great question. And so I am what I, I tell my patients, I'm double board certified. So my first board certification is internal medicine. So internal medicine, um, we basically go through residence, well, four years of medical school and then um I did three years of residency on top of that. And there's intro medicine and family medicine. And that's pretty much your, your primary care physician. If I think most people have a PCP and mm -hmm. most people are going to either be intro medicine or, or um, family medicine. As intro medicine, we spend uh, more time in the hospital training during different rotations. And I pretty much loved all the different specialties and really wanted to create long-term relationships with my patients. So I gravitated towards uh, intro medicine. And like, you know, most young physicians, you know, you go through training. I um, always wanted to, to help people and um, was just had this curiosity about um, how to heal people. Uh, I did go to a, a DO program, osteopathic medicine uh, at Michigan State University. And from the get go, I think um, as DOs were trained to to think a little bit more holistically and that the body is an integrated whole. So we're definitely, uh, we took classes with, uh, Michigan State has both an MD program and a DO program. So all of our uh, core science classes were, were together. So we got the same exact training. Um, and then as DOs, we were also trained in something called like OMT or osteopathic manual medicine. So I think from that standpoint, I was always interested in, you know, gosh, the body is all connected and, and you know, you know, if you have a headache, maybe that's related to something with stress or something else going on. It's not just, okay, like it's just a headache. So, mm -hmm. you know, I came out of medical school, joined a practice and, you know, hit the, the ground running and just trying to treat patients and was seeing hospital patients and office patients, um, but always had this curiosity about, you know, I want to add more tools to my tool bag. Um, so I had the opportunity mm -hmm. Uh, one of the positions I held was working for the University of Michigan and right on, on the college campus. And so I would treat students and faculty and staff. Um, and I was in, accepted to a program called the Faculty Scholars in Integrative Medicine. And it was a year-long program where every Friday we would spend time learning about complementary and alternative ways of healing. So what that 
really opened my eyes to was that, you know, there's more than just conventional medicine out there. And a lot of these Mm -hmm. conventional alternative ways of healing have been around a lot longer than our Western medicine. So one week we might um, meet with a naturopathic doctor and philosophy about that and and how they approach um, their treatment plans or Reiki or traditional Chinese medicine, um, acupuncture, um, mind body medicine. So really during that course of that year, it was a a huge growth period for me because I um, wasn't trained in this in medical school. And it wasn't that I was trained how to be an acupuncturist or how to perform energy, but that I was aware of it. And, and I think that a lot of um, times as you know, you go through medical school, you're like, this is a way, this is the only way, this is how Mm -hmm. you, you know, we treat diabetes in this fashion and this is how you go about it. So that just, again, made me more curious to learn more and went on from there to do a professional training in mind-body medicine through the Center of Mind-Body Medicine um, with James Gordon, who's one of the forefront um, pioneers in in mind-body medicine. And again, then it was like, wow, this is really (laughs) amazing. and, and So, you know, fast forward, I now have been practicing for 23 years, and I feel like I really try to approach wellness and healing from just a multi modality and a very holistic. Um, and when I became, I became board, board certified in lifestyle medicine in 2019. Um, so about three years ago and how that came about is, um, my kids were about to go off to college and, and like many of your listeners, you know, you try to juggle a bunch of things. You know, I was a physician, I'm a mom, I'm a, a spouse, I'm mm-hmm. into endurance uh, sports. And so like juggling and juggling. And so when my kids went off to college, I really felt like I had more time to focus on my career and kind of what were my next next steps? You know, did I want to go do a fellowship in something else? And, and I really wanted to follow my own passion. And so I literally sat down at the computer with Google because that's how you, you know, <laughs> solve all of your problems in life and started like, combining um, words that had true deep meaning for me and a, and a calling and a passion. So it was literally like wilderness medicine, nature medicine, um, wellness medicine, and then up popped lifestyle medicine. And so went down the rabbit hole of, well, what is this? And came to the American College of Lifestyle Medicine and read through the description and read through the pillars. And for me, it was, it was felt like coming home because it was like, oh my gosh, I'm blown away because this is what I've been honing my skills and my true belief system um, to be a healer. And this really aligns so well with with my deepest beliefs of how not only I take care of myself, but how I want to approach care of my patients. Um, So then became a whole certification process where we had to do um, uh, module online modules. We had to do a case study. We had to attend conferences and then you had to sit for a a board exam. Um, So proud to say that, you know, I passed my boards. And um, so so it has been a wonderful community. It's we're really looking to shift the paradigm of how we approach care and and medicine. Um, And it's um, something that I I truly believe, you know, the universe has provided uh, to me at the right, right stage of my life and my career. Yeah. That's amazing. Oh, I love that so much. I, I see that's such a, a difficult thing when I have, you know, clients as a dietitian coming to me and, you know, the doctors that they've worked with and it's just, you know, they just feel frustrated and they're just like, oh, I just, <laughs> you know, they, they lose hope in doctors. And that's what's, you know, really, really kind of sad how the Western medicine has taken over. But I love that they're you know, is this field that's coming, that's recognizing there's a holistic approach we need to take a little bit more. So that's so, so cool. Definitely. So you mentioned the six pillars of lifestyle medicine. I would love to know what those six pillars are. (laughs) I would love to tell you about those six pillars. (laughs) So the six pillars, um, we start with nutrition and really we think about food as medicine, which we know it is, right? So Hippocrates said, how many hundreds of years ago, let food be thy medicine and medicine be thy food. And he said that, right? And how far we've gotten away from that. So um, with the pillar of nutrition, we really advocate for a whole food plant-based dietary pattern. Whether you want to frame that as plant slant, plant strong, uh, plant forward, the evidence and research clearly is shown that that is the optimal dietary pattern. 
Um, and in fact, they just came out with a report of the 25 best and worst diet plans. And Dean Ornish's, um, who's one of our pioneer of lifestyle medicine, his dietary plan, the Ornish, um, which is a plant-based, uh, plant-forward dietary plan, um, came out number one. So we're very happy to see that. So that's number one. food is medicine more plants, more plants. And so within the plants, it's your fruits and your vegetables and your beans, legumes, your, your whole grains, um, nuts and seeds and things like that. Second pillar would be movement. And I like to frame it as movement rather than exercise. I find that, um, that. sometimes my patients or individuals, when you say exercise, it sounds like a chore of like, mm -hmm. I have to go to the gym and I have to get on one of those machines or I have to lift weights and that I just, you know, A, I don't have a, you know, resources to that um, for whatever constraints, or I'm intimidated. And so I frame it as movement. I'm like, I don't care what you do. Move your body. Like if you, you know, want to walk, if you want to hike, if you want to bird watch, if you want to dance, if you want to hula hoop, um, play tennis and play pickleball, anything. And we look at um, the blue zones, which you're familiar with the blue zones. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So when, um, uh, Dan Buettner did his research project, you know, many years ago and went all over the world to look for the healthiest populations and the, the biggest um, percentage of centurions, people living into their hundreds. He identified, you know, nine common pillars um, within the blue zones. And one of them was movement. And in Okinawa, Japan or Sardinia, Italy, they're not going to Planet Fitness, right? <laughs> they're, right. <laughs> they're not getting on the elliptical. Um, they yeah. are moving constantly, whether they're, mm -hmm. you know, harvesting their own foods or they're walking to their, their neighbors to go um, see each other. They're doing pickup soccer. So it's just, it's movement and just moving our bodies. And, you know, I, I find... Gosh, now with um, COVID and how so many people have gone remote, I mean, people are sedentary, right? Yes. I mean, and it's like, you know, I come to my office every day and it's not that I'm like on a treadmill, but I get up and I, you know, walk to my printer and I walk to another patient and I walk to the front desk. So, you know, you are moving. And I think that a lot of people, as they transition to their home office, it's like you're at your computer all day. Um, mm -hmm. So I will move on. Pillar number three is sleep. And so, so important. And I don't think I realized how important sleep was until I really started, you know, preparing for my boards and, and reading more books. Um, and if you uh, may be familiar and, and your listeners too, but probably one of the best books that I've read is Why We Sleep by Matthew Walker. And um, absolutely fascinating. And he's done some TED Talks. And after that, reading that book and then listening to his TED Talks, I'm like, oh my gosh, like, sleep is so important. Um, so we really, so much healing and like detoxifying goes on while we sleep. And, you know, we're all familiar with the lymphatic system of like the lymph nodes that clean out our infection and try to keep us healthy. In our brains, we actually had the glymphatic system, which when we sleep, our brain and the glymphatic system, when we get into our deep sleep is like getting rid of toxins, including like amyloid protein, which amyloid protein is involved in like Alzheimer's dementia. So we really aim for at least seven hours of sleep. Um, and, you know, ideally that's uninterrupted sleep. I know that, you know, I'm in my fifties now, so it's like menopause and you got to go to the bathroom <laughs> and things like that. Um, right. and, and the importance of sleep hygiene, right? I think that uh, in a culture of being busy, sometimes it'd be glorified. Oh, you only need four or five hours of sleep. Wow, you're so lucky. Wow, that's great. And that's not the case. Like, you shouldn't aim to be that person. <laughs> you should aim for right. at least seven, optimally about eight hours. And really making it kind of like your medicine, too, of just mm -hmm. prioritizing. Like, what I try to do is whatever time I have to get up in the morning, I'll work backwards. Be like, okay, I could be up by five. I need to be in bed by 10. And mm -hmm. the blue light, right? We think that getting on our phones and scrolling through, well, now this Wordle is so important, like everyone's doing Wordle, or you know, being on Facebook or Instagram, we think that's relaxing. But that blue light, you know, as it stimulates, you know, goes through our retina, stimulates the pineal gland, decreases melatonin. So I try to tell my patients, you can't watch TV, you can't get on your phone. You know, if you want to read a book, that's fine. You know, sleeping in a cool environment, not eating too late, avoiding alcohol and caffeine. So really treating the sleep pillar so strongly. Um, moving on to the fourth pillar, avoidance of risky behaviors. Um, we know that tobacco is a 
World Health Organization Class 1 carcinogen, right? <laughs> we know that that's there. We all know that smoking is bad for us and, and what it does, you know, obviously for lung cancer and then also, you know, all the vascular complications that come out with it. And then um, alcohol, alcohol too is, is cancer causing. Um, so recommendations for females, no more than one alcohol drink per night, uh, per day, and then men too. So we don't want to excessive alcohol. And then we also do say um, uh, drug use as well. Um, the fifth pillar would be stress management. And we all have stress in our life. I mean, it's unavoidable. Mm -hmm. um, and unfortunately, our brains and bodies don't know the difference between a tiger chasing us, or in my case, my 22 year old driving around in the middle of the night, right? <laughs> Still emit that cortisol, produce that cortisol level, which just, you know, fight or flight. And so, how do we manage stress? Um, like I said, I was, I did some training in mind body medicine. So, try to uh, give my patients practical tools, whether it's deep breathing exercises, um, meditation, uh, body scans, journaling, things like that, of how we can help. Um, can't eradicate stress, but how we can best manage it. Um, and the sixth and final formal pillar of lifestyle medicine is um, the role of social connection. We as humans are social creatures. Like we need our belonging. We want our hugs. We want our contact. And, and this has been so challenging for the past two years because we haven't been able to do this. Mm -hmm. um, we're missing, you know, and I think we all feel that void. So you know, places of belonging can be your family. It can be places of worship. It can be, for me, it's like, and I'm sure similar to you, like my running group or my Viking group. Yes. So <laughs> where we, we feel we have support, we feel loved, we feel, um, you know, a, a sense of commonality. I do add on a seventh pillar um, that is very near and dear to my heart, and that is daily exposure to nature and fresh air. And I think oh, that this is like that. so important, you know, and I live in Michigan and you live in a cold weather state. So uh, people will say, yeah, but doc, like it's snowing out and it's like zero. <laughs> so I say to them, and one of my famous quotes is there's no bad weather, just inappropriate clothing. So you get your coat on, you get your hat on, you get yes. your clothes, go outside, right. you know, and just like 15 minutes of a walk outside of, you know, active meditation and I'll, you know, tell patients like, go outside. I just want you to like, maybe focus on like what sounds you're hearing. Do you hear birds? Do you hear deer rattling? Do you hear leaves rustling? Focus on sights like, wow, you know, it was a beautiful snowfall and look at how the snow is falling on the leaves or the sun is rising. So all of, you know, nature is just, um, I, I need it every day. I got to get my nature yeah. every single day, no matter what the <laughs> So that's a little bit of background about um, how I approach patient care. Is I, it's not that I don't prescribe yeah. medication, but I really want to emphasize the utmost um, importance of those lifestyle behaviors. We know that about 80 to 90% of our chronic diseases, chronic diseases being high blood pressure, high cholesterol, type 2 diabetes, obesity, heart disease, even like Alzheimer's dementia, 80 to 90% are lifestyle related. 5 to 10% are genetic. So, you know, because I'll have patients say, well, doc, you know, I'm going to get diabetes. And I'm going to have a heart attack. I mean, everyone in my family. Did. <laughs> and I said, well, you know, that's right. Genes run in families, but so do recipes and lifestyles. So if you grew up yes. like, hey, we get KFC, you know, for dinner and then we go like to the movies and get butter popcorn and. And yeah, we, we, we don't really exercise. Like we go to the movies, you know, which mm -hmm. is, you know, this is not a judgment statement, but right. that is what's passed down on families sometimes. Right. So the mm -hmm. good news and what I try to convey is the good news is you can do something about it. Right. Yes. You are not destined to your genes. Absolutely. Yes. You can take control and I want to be um, the physician that can help you achieve yes. vitality. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, absolutely. I absolutely believe in that. I actually just had this conversation with my mom today. She got her blood work back. She's never had her cholesterol down to like 200 and she's so happy. Um, and she's been eating more plant-based and I'm avoiding dairy. And I was like, see, I told you. Yeah. <laughs> and she has high cholesterol in her family. Yeah. Your father mm -hmm. had heart disease. So. Yeah. And that's going to feel so good to her, you know, yes, that, it does. that she made some changes and that's where those numbers can be really helpful because because people get objective results. They're like, wow, yes. I, I did that on my own. No medication. I did right. it on my own. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Absolutely. Yeah. It's just a, such a good feeling. She's like, I'm so proud. I can't wait to go to my doctor and oh, have her being so, you know, I can't wait to what she says and see, you know, just see what I did. Without well, I'd be so proud of her if I was her physician. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So she's so excited to go into her doctor's office, which is a good feeling. Yeah. A lot of people like they just don't want to go. They're like, well, well, no, it's not going to be good. That, right. That you, you go to a doctor's and you're going to be told like, oh, you need to lose weight. Mm -hmm. Oh, you need to, you know, go on a cholesterol medicine, but no, no real tools on how to accomplish that. Right. Right. And, and I have to say, until I really did this training on my, and soul searching on my own, I wasn't properly trained how to, I mean, you're a dietitian and nutritionist, so you know how to do this. Yes. Everything I learned in nutrition, um, was, well, I'll just back up a, a little bit. I graduated from medical school in 1998, a long time ago. Um, <laughs> and it hasn't changed. The average amount of hours of nutrition training in medical, medical school throughout residency is 17 hours. 17 hours in my seven years. And you know what that nutrition training was? Um, I memorized the Krebs cycle. <laughs> which we never use, <laughs> we never use. Um, or then it's about like let's learn about tpn and how to feed to feed people in the hospital again like during my ICU. Oh, wow day. so um i didn't know a lot of this stuff and so i think that you know as clinicians we, we weren't trained in this so you're kind of like well eat yeah. healthier and oh you're like well, what does that mean i don't know what that means you know because there's so much out there as far yeah. as you know marketing and gimmicky diets of like mm -hmm. you know are like I don't know <laughs> yes yes absolutely yeah there's a lot of a lot of things out there a lot of misinformation about nutrition mm -hmm. yeah, absolutely so what do you think is the biggest challenge for people to change their lifestyle what do you see that people just struggle so much in making that lifestyle change yeah so I think you know I'll come back to kind of what I was just saying is that I think you need to have partners in this that support you right? Yes, um, accountability. Yeah. And, and, and even a partner in, in your physician or your dietitian, mm -hmm. or if you're seeing a therapist of, it's gotta be a team. Yes. And when I see patients, yes, I'm their doctor, but this has to be a team approach. And a lot of my right. patients, again, you know, they didn't maybe grow up in a family that promoted health and well-being, right? Mm -hmm. Or they they had um, barriers, socioeconomic, or um, you know, accessibility, or their lives are just oh my gosh, I'm trying to support my family. I'm working three jobs. I just and so mm -hmm. meeting patients where they're at, right? And yes. again, small actionable steps that people can take and feel good about accomplishing those, right? So we've got our mm -hmm. stages of change and, you know, anywhere from pre-contemplative of like, do I even have a problem? And like, can I even, <laughs> does, does, does my Big Mac even really cause health problems? Like, you know, because a lot of people right. just don't know, right? Mm -hmm. And that's okay, right? That's totally acceptable. Um, mm -hmm. Moving along that stages of change to like, hey, you know, it really, the food that goes in your body does matter. Oh, really? And I said, here, let me, let me give you some resources. And so that first visit, I'm just trying to sort of say, wow, you know, you, you, do you want to get healthier? Most people, of course, people want to get healthier, right? Would you mm -hmm. like to get off some of your medications? Well, of course. I mean, who wants to take 20 medications <laughs> side effects a day? So rather than saying, well, do this, do this, do this, do this. I mean, no one's going to do that. I want to do that. I'd be like, yeah, right. see ya. Um, <laughs> it's like, you know, do you think that the food that you eat, you know, could be contributing. And sometimes it's like, well, I have no idea, you know, and then sort of, well, I, I think it could be. Um, and so I have um, a list of some documentaries for, uh, for patients to watch and maybe, a, you know, one book, maybe two books. Um, How Not to Die is, you know, one of those that I think yes. that Dr. Michael Greger and I said, love that. Listen to an audiobook because he reads it and he is, you know, he, he's so demonstrative and um, <laughs> amazing. So, you know, I say, you know, emphasize like you, you know, your body the best and you're an intelligent person. I don't, I want you to come into this on your own. I'm going to help guide you and I'm going to give you mm -hmm. support, tools, resources. So, you know, go home, sit on the couch and watch TV. They're like, oh, okay, I like this doctor. Um, <laughs> and it's amazing that once people will watch either Forks Over Knives or Game Changers or What the Health or how seriously it's like, like no one told me this before. Like, 
seriously. And I, I think those are really well done, yeah. right? That um, yes. they're very convincing. And so, and people will come back and be like, okay, like I, <laughs> I, I want to learn more. So then yeah. we'll take small steps, you know, like how confident are you that yeah. instead of having a glass of cow's milk, could you switch to a plant-based milk? Like that's, you know, might mm -hmm. taste different, but you'll still be able to put in your cereal or make it with your oatmeal or, um, and they're like, yeah. I think I can do that. Like on a, you know, scale of zero to 10. Yeah. I'm about a seven or eight. I think I can do it. So then we work on that. Or could you move your body more? Could you go for a mm -hmm. 10 minute walk? I think I could do that. So these small actionable steps. So I think it's just, um, yeah. first of all, that boundary is just getting that awareness there. And then, um, and for some of these changes, I mean, to go to a plant strong way of eating coming from, families and traditions and ethnic recipes that are handed down from families, that's scary. And that's asking a lot, right? Mm -hmm. um, yes. I got a patient several months ago and gosh, was she uh, Greek or something like that? And she's like, Dr. Sonderman, like our famous family recipe, we serve at every special occasion is, it has meat in it. And no. I mean, I can never have that again. I'm like, no, of course, you know, this is what we're talking about. We want plant strong. You know, the optimal way of eating is 100%. But anywhere along that slope, you're going to get benefits. So I'm not going to ask you that you have to skip your family tradition of these, you know, these memories. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, really, um, I guess, just education, support, and in believing in my patients. Because I think a lot of times when I was studying for my lifestyle medicine boards, I remember a colleague saying to me, well, why are you taking this exam. And I'm like, well, because like, I want to become board certified in lifestyle medicine. I'm going to help improve lives. He's like, Melissa, come on, patient, patients don't change. And I'm like, I believe they do. Like given people yeah. want to be healthy, people don't want to be sick. You know, they, yeah. really, they really don't. Um, yeah. So I think it's, it's believing that, that, you know, people can, can make changes. Yeah, absolutely. I love that. Cause I think sometimes people just need somebody to believe in them. Mm -hmm. And then if they know like, okay, my doctor believes in me, so I can do it. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> so I love that. Awesome. And do you think your patients see that you practice what you preach or what does that look like? Do they ever comment yeah. on like, well, do you go for a run every day or? <laughs> well, I'm sitting in my exam room right now and we'll see if we can get my, my medical assistant is awesome. And so yeah, you, there's some pictures up there and one of them is my <laughs> Garmin that reads, you can't see it from that far, but it reads 50,000. And that was my 50th birthday. And I was bound and determined to get 50,000 steps. There's awesome. another one of me mountain biking. Another one up there is me with one of my dogs and another picture of me with Michael Greger and how not to die and diet. Um, oh, nice. So I, I, I tell, you know, I tell patients that, and I, I believe that as a lifestyle medicine physician, where we advocate for these pillars of lifestyle, you have to practice what you preach. You have to, you have to be living this yourself or it's not genuine. Right. Mm -hmm. If I was telling my patients the benefits of a whole food plant based way of eating, and then I'm out there like in between patients chewing on a Big Mac, like, <laughs> you know, and, and, right. and I'm real about it. Like I, I move my body pretty much every day and that's just part of my habit. Right. Um, yeah. and my lifestyle, but I'll tell you what, and you probably can relate to this. I, um, I, I exercise before work cause it's really the only thing I can control. Right. My days get busy yeah. with patients. I'm not sure when I'm going to be done. I have after work meetings. Mm -hmm. So right now when I get up at four 30 or five in the morning, it is dark out. It is maybe a positive number, <laughs> a <probably laughs> negative number with the windshield. And yeah. Uh, I'm going to have to go outside and run. So it's not like I jump out of bed and think, God, I can't wait to go outside <laughs> in the cold and the wind. But it's mm -hmm. become a habit in that my husband and I run together um, every morning. And it's a great time for us to connect and sort of set the tone for the day is it's mm -hmm. non-negotiable that we're going to do it. Now, if we're like injured, mm -hmm. you know, we're not stupid. Right. But what right. we do is, um, you know, one of us will check the weather on our phone and, you know, like this morning it was like, oh, it's actually like 10 degrees and we're like, oh, <laughs> real feel like negative six. So all that we're getting information is how to dress, right? We're not going to, we take away the dialogue of should we, shouldn't we, I don't know. Um, because yeah. once you create that dialogue, there's an excuse for everything, right? Yes. Like I could have like this morning found like it's dark out. 
Um, it snowed two days ago. The roads could be icy, even though we go to a pathway that's they solved it. Um, the wind, chill, you know, I'm tired. But mm -hmm. we just say, like, you're never going to re regret it. Like, get, right. once you take those first couple of steps and you're out there, I've never regretted, regretted the time that I have, you know, taken the self-care to move my body. Yeah. Uh, so that's why I tell my patients, it's not easy, you know, but you love to run. I'm like, I love to run. Yes, I do. But <laughs> there's times that I do not feel like doing it, but I know I'll, I feel better after I do it. So, and again, yes. like with the sleep, um, you know, I have altered the way that I approach my sleep hygiene. I share that with patients. So I think it's good to be, um, you know, I don't disclose all my personal life to my patients, but to be transparent in that, you know what, I'm not perfect either. And so sometimes like on this pillar, this is where I struggle or I'm trying to get better mm -hmm. at this. Um, so I, I really feel like in order to be a lifestyle medicine physician, yep, you got to practice what you preach. <laughs> so walk the walk. Yes. If you're talk the talk, you have to walk the walk. Yes, absolutely. Yes, I definitely absolutely agree. Even as a as a registered dietitian, mm -hmm. yeah, absolutely. Um, what else? Oh, I wanted to talk a little bit about your journey because I saw that you've ran Boston ten times, completed mm -hmm. three full Ironman triathlons, and are currently training for several upcoming ultra marathons. Can you tell us more about your journey as a plant-based endurance athlete? And I'd like to know too, have you always been, you know, plant, consider yourself plant-based endurance athlete your whole, your entire life? Or was it when you started to, you know, study more about lifestyle medicine or what did that look like as well? It's a great question. <laughs> and the, the answer is no, I have not always been exclusively plant-based. I would say, um, I, pretty much was a pescatarian, a um, little bit of chicken. Um, prior to really when I went completely all in was um, about three years ago when I got board certified and again, had to practice what I preach. Um, yeah. And it was really because lack of knowledge, again, like my nutrition mm -hmm. education was through the magazines that I read or on some like website, like slow twitch for the, is a website for endurance athletes and whatever <laughs> people were saying. And I'd see all those ads for chocolate milk. And I'm like, oh, that is the perfect recovery. Drink, you know, <laughs> that has a perfect mix of carbohydrates and healthy fats and, you know, like and protein. And so it was just yeah. media influences. I mean, that's how I got yeah. mine. And um, so I didn't know any better. And I was definitely yeah. of the mindset of, Every pre-race meal had to have protein, but in my mind, protein was only animal, right? And I was mm. smart enough, at least I thought it was, that I only did the healthy white meat, right? So I would only do chicken because that's white, um, you know, and it's like, I look back and like, and, you know, and that's the healthy meat and then fish. And, and when you look at the blue zones, they do consume a little bit of fish, but I was convinced. Yes. So if I got like pizza a night before a race, it had to have chicken on it. Absolutely had to have chicken <laughs> and my protein. Um, so when I started studying for my lifestyle medicine boards and, um, you know, watched Game Changers came out a little bit afterwards. And then, you know, really, I, I listened to Dr. Michael Greger's book and read the book. I was like, whoops. <laughs> um, yeah. And so I just felt like I couldn't go back. Right. Um, yeah. Once I, I knew that information and like, I actually can get plenty of protein through plants. Didn't know that. Um, I, you know, you don't know what you don't know. Right. So, you know, I obviously had, um, you know, and I grew up as a ballet dancer. I was not like this super, I mean, ballet dancers are athletes in my mind, but um, I yeah. wasn't this competitive like track runner or cyclist or swimmer. So I, yeah. I ventured into this. I did my first marathon right after college at the age of um, 22, I guess it was. And then gradually got in, did my first marathon, um, my first Boston marathon in 1996. So I was 26 at the time. And then gradually through, you know, Hey, I want to try that. You know, I'll try a triathlon. Next thing I know, I'm like, Hey, I'm going to try an Ironman. Um, well, I was, I need another one. So, you know, I've, I've ventured in there and, um, and like I said, I was pretty much a pescatarian. So I, I ate an overall healthy diet, you know, I mean, then compared to the standard American diet. Um, so when I transitioned to plant-based, um, exclusively about three years ago, along with my husband, and it's a funny story because when I got board certified, I said to my husband, I said, John, I got to, I got to do this whole food plant-based thing. I, I can't not do it and practice lifestyle medicine. And he said, okay, fine. I'll do it with you for 30 days. And <laughs> so 
That was three years ago. Um, because <laughs> really good, you know, we're in our fifties now. And what I find yeah. is that like my recovery, like inflammation and things yeah. like that. And my cravings, I was, um, a, peanut M&M um, addict, I will say, and it's like <laughs> a, a sweet tooth and like, oh, plant-based. And it's not like, you know, I, I just don't have that craving. Um, right. My taste buds change, you know, like, wow, Brussels sprouts, I actually like them. And, mm -hmm. um, and then, yeah. um, you know, I, we both sleep better. Um, my husband played soccer throughout his, you know, life and, and collision and had three ACLs. So his knee pain, his inflammation went down. We all know about the micro uh -huh. microbiome and, you know, the immune system and how yeah. important that is. And fiber in the diet is the only thing that mm -hmm. nurtures our gut microbiome. Mm -hmm. So I feel like now I'm older now, right? I set PRs in my, my forties. <laughs> I'm not expecting to be plant-based. And now I'm like, Hey, I'm 50 and I'm running my three or four marathons. Like I used to be able to do like, no, like I'm in my fifties right. and I've sort of, check those boxes of PRs. And I'm just, you know, I am thrilled that like, I can do the things I want to do in my fifties. Right. I don't take yeah. any medications. I feel good. You know, I yeah. ran this morning. Um, I'm going to, you know, finish up seeing patients afternoon. I think I'm going to head out and go cross country skiing afterwards. Like I feel oh, good. You know, <laughs> I, my energy levels are yeah. great. Um, my mood is good. We, we are learning more and more about that gut microbiome and the prebiotics and the fiber in our food fiber only found in fruits, vegetables, beans, and whole grains. And once you have a healthy gut microbiome, wow, you know, the yes. world is your oyster. oyster Everything else water. comes together. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So I'm, yeah. um, I'm going to run the Zion 50 K um, in April with some girlfriends. We're all in our fifties. Awesome. We're all, you know, still getting at it and have creating adventures and um, yeah. ran my 10th Boston marathon in October. And awesome. yeah, so I'm just still doing fun stuff. That's great. I love that. I absolutely love that. And it's great to just, yeah, to just be able to share that you, you know, that you can, you know, have a good quality of life as you age. Mm -hmm. And I think that's so important for people to see, like, you can do it. You just yeah. got to make these lifestyle changes, even though at first they're, they're hard to make. Right. So I love that. Um, and what is one resource that you purchased that was the best investment to help you in your plant-based journey? And you mentioned some documentaries that you share with patients. Yeah, I do. And then I'll, I'll take it from more of a personal standpoint. Sure. One of the best resources I have, and this was not purchased, is having um, people to do this with me, right? Like I said, my husband and I run together pretty much every morning, Um and then accountability, right? So if I'm feeling yes. like, oh, he's like, come on, let's go, right? So that helps. Yes. And then um, my girlfriends, um, we run together. Gosh, we've run together through a, for, through friendships, through marriages and divorces and kid stuff. And so having oh. having the people that keep you not only accountable, but that you love doing it with them. So that's yes. I think one of my strongest resources. Um, so I've got my vibe. Um, you know, I'm not a lady who lunches. Like I'm, my happy hours are going for runs with my girlfriends on the weekend, <laughs> right? And then, yes. um, you know, I I went away last weekend with some girlfriends um, for a weekend, and I said to my husband, I'm like. I think this is the first time I've gone away with my friends that hasn't involved a race because usually <laughs> that's what we do. Like we like go to an event together, right. go to an event together. Like we're going out to Zion together. So yeah. that was not something I purchased. I think that, um, you know, what keeps what resource? Um, I've got a Garmin. I've got you know a wearable, and mm -hmm. I. I um, I love it because I have it on my phone. And so now I'm able to track my sleep. Um, I don't want to get too, like, I don't, you know, I just like to know like, Hey, did I get decent sleep right. and when I'm sleeping and my steps and um, mm -hmm. you know, nowadays I really don't care about my pace anymore, but, but mm -hmm. I definitely, I think that um, we're seeing more movement into these wearables and this it and personalized um, and yeah. it helps even with my patients too. I'm like, you know, and mm -hmm. anyone who's got a smartphone, there's a built-in pedometer there, the Fitbits. Um, and yes. I think, you know, getting that curiosity of like, Hey, can you increase your steps by 500, you know, can you, mm -hmm. um, and, um, yeah, like I said, the documentaries I use, you know, to, and then I, I love podcasts. So here you are, you know, you've got yes. podcasts live. Um, that has been a great education tool for me and my patients. So I've generated like a list of, of podcasts. <laughs> I love to learn. So I learn awesome. all the time from my podcast. So when I'm not running with um, other people or going for a walk myself, 
plug in my headphones and yeah. I love to learn. So there you go. And then my running shoes yeah. and my, my bikes and my skis and anything that <laughs> me um, to get outside and be active. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. Oh yeah. We need our, we need our tools to, <laughs> to help us <laughs> be active. Absolutely. And what are some quotes or sayings do you now live your life by? Okay. Good question. Um, so I guess my mantra um, is uh, I always believe the universe has a plan for me. And I think, you know, I'm in my fifties now. Um, life is not perfect. And you go through some hard times, some difficult times. And sometimes you ask yourself or the universe or God, or however you want to frame that, um, like, I wouldn't have chose this pathway given, you know, this has been a difficult, bumpy pathway, but when you can look back, you know, I can almost say that was meant to be in, in a, either a learning course for me or something that I thought was a horrible opportunity. And why is this, you know, you're like, Oh, that actually has been turned out to be a wonderful eye-opening pushing me. Um, so, so I always like to frame each day like that, like, and let, you know, know that I, I like to be in control because that's just how I'm wired, but that ultimately I'm not right. And so sometimes when doors close, it means that, you know, others open or something that I really was, you know, hoping for didn't work out. It's like, that's meant to be in something else, you know, and, and of course you have to, you, you can't just sit complacent and just twiddle your thumbs and say, okay, universe provide for me. You know, you, you have to be, and I feel like, you know, I I say to my husband, like, I can't believe that I'm doing lifestyle medicine now. And I like, I've been on podcasts and I'm like, I'm talking to people about this and, um, and maybe no one listens, but maybe people do. Um, but you've been honing this for over 20 years. And I'm like, yeah, I guess you're right. You know, so I think that as we just um, grow and evolve and um, constantly be curious and and want to push our boundaries. um, So that's, that's my mantra every day. I think quotes, you know, my patients, like, (laughs) they probably hear me saying the the, the same sayings. I mean, oh, another quote I love is you miss 100% of the shots you don't take, right? So I really feel like I'm the kind of person I'll put myself out there and people might say no, or people like things might not work out. But if I don't push myself, and I love the um, analogy of like a bullseye where you've got your comfort zone, and then the next uh, ring is your challenge zone. And then the outer one is your um, overwhelm zone, right? And you can sit in your comfort zone, like your whole life. And and it's a cozy kind of place. But really, the growth doesn't happen until you really put yourself in that challenge zone. And it's scary. You know, and sometimes you need to retreat back to comfort zone, you know, mm-hmm. um, and then we never want to get to the overwhelm zone where you're like so scattered and, and stressed and you're not sleeping. So mm-hmm. always trying to put yourself into that challenge zone. And like I said, take those shots, you know, because mm-hmm. you might make a few. Um, right. And then in my patient care, like the things that they hear me say is, you know, there's no bad weather, just inappropriate clothing. Food is medicine. I quote Hippocrates. Um, An ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure by Benjamin Franklin. Um, you know, self-care is not selfish because I think that sometimes when I, you know, have people who they're parents and they've got kids that they're raising and, or they're taking care of, you know, Mm -hmm. older parents, um, you know, I'm in the, my age and fifties, there's a lot of, it's a sandwich, right? So you, I've got young adult children. I mean, they're in their twenties and they're kind of launched, but I'm still going to get a text every day from my daughter saying, ma, and then my parents are in their eighties. So there's a lot of pull of being a caretaker. So I really try to emphasize you know, you need to take care of yourself, you know, mm-hmm. and that's not being selfish, right? Um, mm-hmm. It's like when you're on an airplane and the masks drop down, you put your mask on first so that you can yes. take care of someone else. So really emphasizing that that's important and that's okay um, mm-hmm. to be your best self. Um, and then I'm a big fan of gratitude. Um, and, you know, one of the things that I'll, I'll try to get my patients to do is a gratitude list. Um, I think sometimes yes. we get caught up in, in moments and stress and, um, you know, to take the time to really be grateful um, mm-hmm. for little things each and every day. So, you know, gratitude yeah. is the best attitude. So those are some of the yes. things that um, I'm sure my, my medical assistant who <laughs> has a desk on <laughs> door is like, there she goes with her. Um, <laughs> Those would be some of the ones that come to the top of my mind. Yeah. Awesome. I love all of those. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Those are, those are all really great things. Definitely. Anything else you'd like to share? 
I think we yeah, covered exactly. pretty much a lot. Did you do it? Um, <laughs> Yay! Yeah. Yeah. I think we did too. And how can listeners find you and all of that if they like okay. to find you or so, work yeah. with you? Yeah. Um, so I'm on Instagram as um, at Motivator Melissa. And then um, I do have a Facebook group. And now, where we live and when I created it, I created it, um, I guess, two years ago. It's a lifestyle medicine group. And if you've got show notes or anything like that, you can type. Um, it's kind of wordy and it's, it's where we live. It's Wash, uh, Lifestyle Medicine, um, Washtenaw slash Livingston County. Now that's a lot of big words, but maybe if you've got show notes. Um, and then yeah, my email is just my name, all spelled out, Melissa Sunderman um, at IHACares.com. That's, I work for IHA. We have a Lifestyle Medicine Institute. Um, I do Lifestyle Medicine Consults. Um, we have Lifestyle Medicine Interest Group. So we're really trying to promote and shift the paradigm of how we practice medicine. Yeah. Awesome. Yay. Yes. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll definitely link all those in the show notes below this video as well. Okay, um, great. So everyone can get that as well. And then one last question. If today was your last day on earth, what would you want everyone to know that's on their, you know, their lifestyle journey or their plant-based performance journey? What would you want them to know? If you could tell them one thing. <laughs> well, first of all, I'm living to a hundred, but, um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, I think what I want them to know is like, join, join the coolest club. Like we're, you know, because I, it's amazing the transformation that I see um, when friends, when family, when patients really put these pillars of lifestyle medicine, including a plant strong way of eating um, mm -hmm. into practice. It just makes everything better, you know, yes. like, um, and so it's like, I'm all about vitality and longevity and we can keep people alive, but if you don't have right. your vitality, you know, I show a video, there's a wonderful video. Um, it was produced in Canada called make health last. It's about a minute long and I can maybe email it to you and you can share it. Um, and sure. it's a split screen of the same actor and it's what your 10 years could look like in health versus illness. So one of them is like mm. at the same time he's riding a bike versus he's in a wheelchair and the wheels are moving. One of them is his pillbox versus his fly rod flies. Um, the next is, you know, he's tying, pulling up his tie versus pulling up his oxygen, right? And so I will mm -hmm. show that to my patients who are like my age and older that, you know, we're kind of like, yeah, we're getting older. Mm -hmm. Of like, you can, to a certain extent, choose your destiny. You know, do mm -hmm. you want your ten, last 10 years to be living in illness, you know, confined to your house um, or like, do you want to just be able to be with your grandkids and maybe in retirement, actually re enjoy your retirement that you work so hard for? And mm -hmm. like, I'm going to, I can't guarantee that, but we can increase the, the likelihood that you're going to achieve that. So that's yes. what I would want people to know. Absolutely. I love that. Yes. It's so important for, I think, people to know that, yes, we can keep you along longer because of Western medicine, mm -hmm. but your quality of life yeah isn't is it gonna be great i actually work with um as a dietitian in the nursing home right now and just seeing you know these you know the our elderly just fail the way they are you know in their 80s and of course some of them are in their 90s mm -hmm. and which is fantastic yeah, but just to right. see them fail it's just it's so yeah. sad and they yeah. you know you can tell they're depressed and sad and don't have much of life to live for and i'm like wow yeah. the quality of your quality of life later in life is so important. Yeah. And, and it starts now, right? It actually starts yes. in childhood. It, it yes. actually starts in the womb, right? Because, right. you know, it starts when our mamas are pregnant with us, you know, mm -hmm. and, um, and yeah. just how kids, I mean, when I was growing up in the seventies, right, we got on our bikes and like, we didn't see our parents like <laughs> in the summertime, like all day long, you know, and, and right. kids, we, you know, I saw it with my, my kids growing up, you know, the videos yeah. games came and the, the game boys and things like that. And now phones and, um, mm -hmm. yeah, just, just let's keep playing and let's be active and let's just keep going after it. And yes. an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Start early. Yes, absolutely. I love that. Love that. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for joining me today and yeah. also for all the work that you're doing for others and also just, you know, continuing to preach what, um, you know, practice what you preach, I think is just such an amazing thing and doing so much good in the world to show people, 
you know, another way of life. So well, it's given back to me a, a thousandfold, right? Yeah. You hear about burnouts in lots of careers and yes. me coming into lifestyle medicine and joining a community of like-minded people and, and seeing patients get better. Um, it's given yes. back to me, you know, hundred percent. Yes. Asli, I love that. Awesome. Awesome. So thank you so much. No problem. And I'm you sure we fun. will. Yes, I'm sure we will um, connect again. So. I would love that. Thank you. And thanks thank everyone you. for joining. Bye. Bye.